Okay, very good morning to you. Happy Friday, the 14th of May. And generally speaking, sentiment this morning holding up following the positive close that we had on Wall Street, snapping, of course, a string of consecutive losses we've seen this week as the market's kind of tussled with this idea about um, transitory inflation and a bit of a recovery coming through yesterday. So the S&P closed up around 1.25%. The Dow, similar margin, the Nasdaq 100 closed up about 0.8%. Eight percent that kind of carried through into the Asia Pacific session. That region generally higher as well, following that impetus from the U.S. close. And looking at the charts this morning, let's just have a quick run through from a technical perspective of some of these uh, U.S.-based index futures first. And I'm going to start off with the S&P 500. Uh, this is just looking at. The price performance really of going back to some of the selling pressure that we've had from the beginning of the week. So going back to around Tuesday when it all started to really pick up a bit of pace, the accelerated sell-off that we saw uh, midweek and then the reversal uh, and quite powerfully so yesterday from those lower bound levels. As you can see this morning then continuing to kind of climb a little bit higher through the Asia Pac region. Uh, perhaps now found a little bit of a flaw for the moment in futures price. Uh, as we just get to this area here, uh, which we've just broken out above in the European Open, which was the Asia Pack high range and the high that we saw just before the close on Wall Street, which did see some late selling pressure uh, yesterday. Got some short term trend lines on here uh, for the week. Um, that one that really held up nicely. I think this is back on um, Tuesday or Wednesday's briefing that coinciding the pivot. Uh, with that trend line higher is a really nice short opportunity that I know a few people got hold of to ride that move lower. But on the recovery, it's been well respected as too as it on the bounce, given the break that we saw in the overnight uh, Asia Pac session um, as well. So quick look elsewhere then. Uh, the NASDAQ, of course. Um, well, before we do, let's just have a look at the S&P on a daily because on a daily chart, again, this is something we were looking at as well. Uh, a slightly longer term trend line respective from late October of 2020, early March. Uh, and that was the area really that we we're keeping an eye on. Still fairly firm in the conviction that lower down, you will get some um, quite aggressive dip buying. And that area at 4021 we had highlighted yesterday. Uh, close proximity to that before we saw that initiation of the, the fairly strong rebound that's underway at the moment. Uh, any further recovery here on the daily? Uh, we're trading at 41.26 at the moment, 41.40 uh, could be quite interesting. It starts to bring in some of those respective lows and highs that we had going back to Thursday last week and Wednesday this week uh, on the recovery. As we'll talk about later, obviously retail sales will be quite a key metric as to how that plays out. Uh, elsewhere, before we get into the news headlines, uh, the dollar index at the moment uh, we'll probably explain the currency story. This is looking at the entirety of the week and obviously you can see the seesaw movement that we've had and predominantly the pickup here which was on the back of the CPI reading and since that point as you can see we've basically consolidated from around 1990 at the top uh, looking on the right hand side of the chart here to 9060 at the bottom and we're close towards the lower bound of that move at the moment. That would be quite key. Uh, any breakdown through those lows obviously could open up a steeper reversal down to 90.34, which was around that range high that we had through the best part of the week before the CPI came out. And if that does occur, obviously that could give a supporting hand to uh, further upside and recovery in some of the major dollar based pairs. Uh, on that point, then euro dollar at the moment, um, just be keeping an eye around here, which is the R1, the previous. Uh, morning's high that we had around this time yesterday, 121.13 uh, in the futures uh, would be an upside area. Be keeping an eye on if we have any further upside, which we're already seeing kind of trend up this morning with some slight softening in the greenback. As far as cable is concerned, again, we did say um, yesterday on the higher time frame chart, it felt like cable was kind of due a bit of a pullback after that aggressive breakout that we had on Monday. Following a few different things, of course, with the, the Scottish vote not constituting enough um, majority for pushing further forward anytime soon, the referendum call, um, and with the Conservative performance as well at the local elections, we kind of had that breakout, we pulled back, really nice, kind of perfect recovery on the, on the daily chart here, 
to that area you can see that zone came back to 140 and we've stabilized since we're trading about 50 pips above there at the moment so as far as the day is concerned um, again wouldn't get too drawn into the short-term trend line this morning be looking more from a uh, kind of zoomed out perspective and not seeing too much respect of these levels here so I'd prefer to look at the outer bound range and on the downside um, the area which was the double bottom really to the price activity from yesterday afternoon and evening that coincides with the low that we had on the overnight session on Sunday night going into Monday of this week it's quite a key area to watch we've got the S1 sitting just below that 140 12 and then that 140 handle on the daily was obviously quite important as well on the upside any price recovery kind of two near-term areas i'd keep an eye on 140 71 in the futures which was yesterday um, overnight low and then you've got the r1 uh, as well sitting just above at around 140 84 this morning in sterling um, quick look elsewhere and let's just have a look at a couple of commodities as far as oil is concerned, yeah, pretty tough few days for oil. Pretty rapid decline of about 5%, I think it's been, over the course of the last 48 hours or so. Nothing, I think, that makes me feel particularly bearish. Um, again, I think prudent to just kind of zoom out the chart a little bit, look at the bigger picture. If you look down to where we were trading back just two weeks ago at the beginning of May, we are in a relative lower bound of what is a range for the time being. You can see this small centerpiece here, which was the colonial pipeline gap. That's kind of business as usual now, um, as we had known for the last couple of days. Uh, and as we trade here at the moment, just finding perhaps a little bit of short term uh, resistance on the pullback um, up and around the 64 handle, 63.90, which was those lows you can see tested through Friday last week, Monday, Tuesday, and then in the overnight session as well. So at the moment, kind of keeping an eye in oil at around 63 handle 6304 those previous lows in early may uh, and yesterday uh, and those aforementioned levels on the upside at around 64 handles so you've got a bit of a dollar range there to play with at the moment and then gold finally let's have a look yeah so it had a bit of a, a failed breach of what we were watching with quite a lot of intensity yesterday, which was, you know, will we get a breakdown and run lower to reverse the breakout that we had uh, on Thursday and acceleration of gains in gold on Friday last week? Uh, hasn't materialized though. And since that bounce now, uh, we're kind of middle of this kind of range for the time being. And so at the moment, I'm not really looking at gold with too much interest at this point. Uh, near term platform if we did get that dollar weakness be interested to see if we get the type of price action where uh, in the interim period of this kind of more broad range on that um, double top that you've got from yesterday afternoon and evening a breakout with a push back above you've got the R1 sat just above at 34 and a half and then for the, the push back up to the top end of the range again up at 42 and a half uh, could be uh, an interesting play if we do get that dollar move uh, continue to play out in terms of a, a break of that Dixie range we discussed and uh, if that just helps uh, the gold direction going forward. All right, well, let's have a look at a couple of the news stories in play. First off, starting with this, uh, the US CDC has advised that fully vaccinated people do not need to wear masks outdoors and can avoid wearing them indoors in most places. So quite a shift here in what's seen as the traffic light system in the US. They basically have a table where it's like what you can and can't do and it's those who've been vaccinated, those who haven't. And those who've been vaccinated can do pretty much everything now in America. An um, interesting point though on this particular um, article is that there are concerns that with rules the same for everyone, there's not enough incentive to people to get vaccinated. So obviously vaccination rates are still moving higher in America. Um, they've slowed down considerably over the last couple of weeks. But how many more people now, if you think about it, if you kind of give people back their freedom, well, then probably um, the likelihood is there's less a likelihood that then they're going to get vaccinated, essentially. Uh, and certainly as we go through what Biden's been trying to do, is trying to target certain pockets of society that perhaps are slightly more 
um, or according to various different studies and polls, a little bit more reticent to take the vaccine. You know, this could well further accelerate that trend, which I don't think is a massive thing, but perhaps it just decelerates further the ability to hit these targets that we're talking about, which was Biden's administrations of 70% vaccinated by July 4th. Um, obviously, as well, whenever you go through a significant shift like this in lockdown loosening, like not wearing masks, um, even though this is for vaccinated people, how, do, how well do people adhere to the rules and so on? Uh, and again, um, how transmissible now will this virus be going further forward? So worth keeping an eye on those numbers. And definitely in the UK, things have, have, have obviously, you've had PM Johnson pretty busy yesterday. He said health officials are quite anxious uh, about the COVID-19 variant first identified in India and refused to rule out the possibility of localised lockdowns to stem its spread. Uh, and again, kind of already trying to set people's and manage their expectation about the eventual end of lockdown on June 21st and that there could be some flexibility around that date. Uh, again, whether it happens on June 21st, the week, two weeks after, I don't necessarily think that's a big headwind for the pound because inevitably it probably will happen. However, this this particular variant does warrant monitoring and particularly as we'll get more data coming next week, we'll be able to make a much better, more definitive idea of whether or not that June 21st deadline is going to be realistic or not. And if not, how further um, delayed might it be? Um, a couple of context here. Um, there's been 1,768 sequenced cases of the most concerning strain from India as per the chart here. It's known as the B16172. Um, it's now the second most common variant in the UK because remember case rates relatively speaking are, are quite low at the moment it accounts for roughly 15% of the virus sampled sequenced over the last two weeks but what's been quite concerning it's up from just 7% one week earlier um, some are concerned that there are signs that it's even more transmissible than that variant that we had in Kent around New Year when we saw that big breakout start localized in Kent but went nationwide pretty quickly and led to one of the worst situations during the pandemic, if you remember, over that post-Christmas New Year period. Uh, this one potentially is seen as even more transmissible than that. And obviously, as far as the nationwide vaccination rate is concerned at the moment, we're still just over 50% at the moment. So still a fair way to go at this point in time. Others though, and I think this is important, have said not to overinterpret just a small pocket of data, which why we're putting more emphasis on getting some more information next week before we can really draw definitive conclusions. Uh, the other thing here is about um, the demographic. And obviously as, as we get down, I actually got the text yesterday um, so I, you know, I tried to book my uh, vaccination, but the nearest place was like 20 miles away. Uh, and being being a, a very recent Londoner, having moved out to the suburbs, I don't have a car, and so it's, uh, and this is like a village hall somewhere in the middle of the woods. So I'm not sure if I can uh, can I have to wait potentially. Uh, but looking here. Uh, these are the case, cases arising again. This is of that particular Indian strain uh, and it's circulating, but the rise is concentrated among young and obviously the less vaccinated age groups. Um, so one thing is from a pressure on the infrastructure point of view, that's prob probably likely not to reoccur uh, given the fact that, uh, again, older people are more subject to um, being showing more kind of aggressive symptom reaction to the virus. There's also underlying medical conditions that I'd already have as well, other treatments in which they're receiving. But obviously it goes some way to show that um, we're still not quite out of this at the moment. Uh, and, and once again, it's the Northwest of England that seemingly has been quite a hot spot uh, and something to look out for in case there is any localized lockdowns. Um, final thing to mention, because other than that, it's pretty quiet for, for news. And then we'll just talk about the data coming out today. Um, it's Tesla. Um, and I'll bring up the Tesla share price because we were talking about this a little bit yesterday. And I was sharing some charts in the community. Uh, and perhaps the chart tells a bit of a story of Tesla's ride over the last 
week. Um, this goes back to a trend line in play from the summer of last year, of which then we broke down through after the share price saw aggressive selling pressure on Monday after Elon's appearance on SNL. Um, you know, this came as obviously um, Doge, Dogecoin or Dogecoin other crypto was under some pressure after he called it a hustle. Then there was, I think it was Tuesday, production issues highlighted in China. He's done the U-turn on Bitcoin payments, uh, which caused Bitcoin to fall 15% yesterday. That's partially recovered, but their share price got hit again. Their stock price is down about 13-ish percent at the moment, uh, but technically doesn't look too good until we get lower down for support um, at 542. Uh, we closed yesterday at 571. So really tough week here. And, and, and once again, he was super active on Twitter last night. He's kind of like the new, the new Trump as far as watching Twitter um, for sensitivity and in initial asset or product reaction. Um, and after he came out and did the U-turn on Bitcoin, he's now come out and clarified, to be clear, I strongly believe in crypto, uh, but it can't drive a massive increase in fossil use. Uh, fossil fuel use especially coal and he's giving the pump to dogecoin again working with doge devs to improve system transaction efficiency potentially promising and then as always don't panic and he's got a picture there of a car um, so once again he's busy at work i don't know i can't help but feel this is all just a bit of a usual pr stunt I know there's a lot of talk and articles written about this whole ESG side of things and obviously Tesla's now in the S&P, it's a phenomenally large company, um, but I'm sure Elon Musk is going to um, continue to be super active on the likes of Twitter over the weekend, so any crypto traders, uh, I definitely would be mindful of that, particularly on the Dogecoin side. Um, quick look at the calendar then for today and what have we got in store so just going to transition we have the ESP minutes out later on at 12.30 uh, this morning not expecting too much of a great deal there I wouldn't anticipate uh, much in the way of a market reaction in European assets really the focal point today is on the US side of things and retail sales is coming at 1.30 now US retail sales has gone through these kind of boom busts if you like and very much associated to the timings around the stimulus checks that have been hitting people's bank accounts. So that's showing up in January and obviously the real uh, blockbuster figure of 9.8% we got last month. Um, as far as today is concerned, um, the reading is expected to come in at 1%, so slightly slower obviously than 9.8% month-to-month reading we had last, last time out. However, the cash deposits in regards to stimulus checks, uh, were made in the second half of the month of March. So there is some suggestion that that might mean there's a bit of a carry through from spending into April. And also as well, there's been further reopenings on a state level across America, which gives people more optionality to spend their money in different ways that perhaps they couldn't have done before. And so that would be a net positive potentially for, for retail sales. So if anything, um, perhaps again, upside bias to this. Um, I definitely wouldn't be looking for the type of seesaw reaction effect that we had on CPI earlier in the week. Uh, but again, this will be quite a key uh, release for later in the session. We also get industrial production at 2.15, University of Michigan preliminary sentiment, so the more market moving of the two, that's at three. We are expecting it to rise to 90 spot four from 88.3. Um, and that last number at 88.3 for Michigan actually was the highest reading since March 2020. So the highest reading since really the onset of the pandemic and a growing sense at the time of upward momentum in jobs. Obviously that hasn't quite materialized as we know in payrolls yet, but that incomes will persistently be propelled by federal stimulus spending and a growing share of the population becoming vaccinated, generally making people feel more confident about the future. And so we're looking for that to, to continue as a trend for the time being. And Fed's Kaplan, uh, non-voter speaks at six o'clock and then that's it. So I'm going to leave it there, let you guys get on with the day. Um, remember that the Market Watch podcast is coming out, Piers and I, 
uh, peers the head of trading will have, kind of have a conversation get a bit of a deep dive into this inflation transitory argument so check that out and i wish you guys a good weekend all right take care